Okay, I work at the University of East Anglia in Norwich and I'm Professor of European Literature and Translation and I'm the Academic Director of the British Centre for Literary Translation, so BCLT um, is situated in a School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at UEA um, and it was it was set up in the late 80s by my predecessor Max Sebald, so the mm. great German writer um, who was a former professor at UEA and had this great idea in the late 80s. So we've been going for getting on for 30 years now and uh, I joined UEA three years ago. Okay. And so you're part of the university, yes. as such, although it's a centre that has a calling that goes beyond the university. That, that right? that's, yes. that's right, yes. Yeah. And historically, BCLT exactly was kind of semi-detached from the university in the sense that it was funded largely by the Arts Council of England, mm. um, which uh, funds... Um, uh, funds work with uh, professional translators um, and so we did that for um, the first 25 yeah. years or so yeah. um, and yet being based within the university um, BCLT continues in that hybrid role. Okay. Uh, are you training work. translators there? We or do, we have yeah. a um, we so we continue that role of reaching out to professional translators, largely now in partnership with Writers Centre Norwich, which mm -hmm. is a literature um, development um, agency that is based in Norwich, uh, okay. so just down the road. Um, yeah. But uh, within the university, we are a research centre. So we're so you're doing research. We're a research centre. Well. That's where my role was a new role created three years ago mm -hmm. to set up. BCLT to reorientate BCLT uh, to become a more traditional research centre within the university academic framework. Okay. So we're a research centre within the humanities faculty um, and the school also runs a master's programme then and uh, I have half a dozen PhD, okay. PhD students and so okay. um, yes so we're also embedded within the university structures. So research means the PhD training and and other research projects, book publications, etc. Yes, um, for example, we have, uh, well, we have a, a postgraduate symposium that, that takes place every couple of years and we're up to the seventh one of those is happening uh, towards the end of this year and I'm currently um, co-editing with uh, the organisers of the previous one, a volume that will okay. be uh, coming out um, uh, early next year on untranslatability. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, a research agenda for the BCLT which uh, brings together research interests of a number of colleagues who are working on translation issues uh, within the school. Okay, great. Can we go back to your mid-20s, 23, 24, something like that? Where, yeah, yeah. Where were you? What were you doing? Um, mid-23, 24, so this was the late 80s in my case. Um, so I'd begun graduate work at that stage. Um, I, my background is in modern languages, in French and German. Uh, and so my PhD work was on... Um, a French author, Proust, and a German philosopher, Nietzsche. And so that was my, so my PhD work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, I was, I was working in Oxford um, uh, on that DPhil. Mm -hmm. um, as part of that, though, I also took a year um, in Paris where I was teaching at uh, Paris 3, I was mm -hmm. a lecturer. Um, and uh, so I, I stayed in Oxford until the early until the early mm. 90s. But, um, so there was no translation in that as such? Not, not yet, no. Mm. Um, of course, as, a, as an undergraduate, I'd been doing a fair amount of translation as part of a modern languages mm -hmm. um, degree. Um, and then quite early on in my graduate career, um, really quite by chance, I was approached by a, uh, an, an academic colleague uh, in Oxford who had been asked to do a translation job um, which she didn't have time for and wondered if I would uh, and I did and that became my first 
uh, my first translated book. So okay. that, 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 right. so that was my first book, and that was that was the first uh, my first book length publication, which was before the publication of my thesis book. Okay. So the the translation, practical translation, work, was there, was yeah. there, and leading towards a an actual product okay. published in the world um, yeah. early on, and that 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 that, that translation was published in ninety three. Okay. But from there, you followed on a, a, an academic career. Yes. But yeah. you've, you've translated quite a lot then, along the way. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Um, I mean, I've translated periodically um, in the course of, an, of developing an academic career, mm. yes. So, um, but yeah. Nietzsche is no mean task. <laughs> so, uh, uh, indeed, and I've, yeah. I've, I've done a couple of book-length Nietzsche translations um, for Oxford World's Classics, um, and they've been, in both cases, late Nietzsche texts where mm. he's being quite um, innovative. And he's always innovative Crazy. stylistically, but uh, yeah, yes. he, even yeah. more so Incredibly in, in, in difficult those texts. To, to, um, to work on. Yeah. Thankfully, I was I was working with Oxford University Press, and so that that series, although it's a high volume paperback series, nonetheless, they allow translators the liberty of quite a lot of translation translator notes. And uh, yeah. I was I was lucky, even though the first one I did um, was in it came out in ninety eight. I was working on it for um, in the nineties um, at a point where I didn't hadn't yet established any kind of. Uh, Reputation as a translator or as a scholar, but I was allowed. I was I was given the uh, opportunity to to write the preface as well. So, Did they um, give you instructions, you know, how to translate for world classics, or were you on your own? I I believe I was on my own. I remember okay. getting some feedback on on a sample that I that I okay. did, and I know that. Um, uh, I know who gave me the feedback, and it was okay. my former supervisor. Ah. I was, um, and it was extremely yeah. helpful uh, okay. to get uh, who also had uh, translation experience. So that was that was very useful. Um, but beyond that, no, the the series editor um, uh, deferred to the external okay. readers that she. Did. Just run us through how you got to East Anglia in academic terms. Um, um, so I. Uh, Continued developing a career in modern languages, um, mm. and uh, so working, um, publishing on uh, largely on Nietzsche, um, and so and I continue to do mm. that, um, but at the same time developing a teaching interest in translation mm. and translation studies. Um, I got my first job in ninety one teaching first at uh, Trinity College Dublin as a, a German lecturer mm -hmm. for uh, it was a temporary post, a one year post. And I was able, thankfully, to move directly on from that to a post at Swansea University in again in German. And that's where I stayed for over twenty years. Mm. Um, okay. so kind of rising up through the ranks yeah. and latterly as as a professor of German. Um, and early on in my Swansea career, I was asked to set up an MA in literary translation. Mm. Um, by that stage, I'd already been teaching translation as part of the German degree um, at undergraduate level. And uh, so that was that was an interesting opportunity, um, which uh, allowed me then to develop a teaching interest, uh, particularly in translation theory. And mm. so I've continued doing that under various guises um, at Swansea and uh, more recently in, in Norwich at, uh, at East Anglia. And at the same time, um, as working on Nietzsche and other topics in German literature and, and, and philosophy and comparative literature, developing then gradually a research interest and a, a number of research interests in translation studies as well. I'm interested in the role of philosophy. Uh, okay, those texts of Nietzsche might be called very literary yes. as such, but... Is philosophy part of the deal? If we're teaching literary translation, is that also philosophical translation? Or where you are at East Anglia, is, is a philosophical translation part of that deal? That, that's a very interesting question because that's, in a sense, that's a question that I bring to BCLT mm. and, and to the, the, the setup at uh, East Anglia because um, the focus of BCLT has yes philosophy has not really been part of of, of bclt's interests mm. so far and and i think it's fair to say of bclt's 
definition of literary translation. Um, so for me, I want to broaden that definition to yeah. include uh, what is not just fiction, uh, drama and poetry. Um, that said, I'm also interested insofar as I program events at BCLT as the academic director to program events in a variety of literary genres as well. Yeah. And I think there's yeah. been actually quite a focus on prose fiction. And so it's been nice to do things in uh, in drama and, and poetry as well. But I'm also, yes, the, the creative writing program at uh, uh, East Anglia um, trains creative writers in a variety of genres, but also um, uh, creative nonfiction, for example. Um, and so I'm just interested in kind of exploring the, the the boundaries of the definition of what literary translation is and yes, in a yes, sense sure. yeah so so philosophy translation very might, much. might be philosophy creative non-fiction right? anyway <laughs> yeah no, it's, it's, well philosophy yeah. certainly yes come comes into it uh, as far as i'm concerned and, and from my own research from the point of view of my own research interests at the moment i'm very interested in uh philosophy translation and philosophers doing translation okay. and i think i'm interested in kind of thinking rather like the question about whether poetry translation is best done by poets, mm. whether philosophy translation is best done by philosophers and what that might mean and what it might, mm. if not, then what that might mean. Mm. That leads us on to what kind of research we might need or what young scholars might look at mm. uh, for, for doctoral work. Do you have any suggestions? Perhaps along those lines. But uh, uh, Yes, um, I'm... I'm supervising half a dozen PhD uh, students at the moment, not specifically on, for example, the, the philosophy translation uh, uh, area that I, I just mentioned. Um, but um, I, I suppose one area that I'm becoming particularly interested in as we, as we think at BCLT about what is specific to literary translation mm. um, it's, I should say that, that uh, the, the MA programme that we have in literary translation within our school is accompanied by an MA in applied translation studies in uh, our sister school in uh, language and communication studies. So you have two MAs in so the we same have, we university. Have, right? We have two MAs mm. in translation in the mm. same university for historical reasons, which I, I, mm. I won't go into. We do work together. I co-supervise with mm. colleagues in uh, the other school, half of those PhD students who I mentioned, I'm co-supervising mm. with okay. uh, a colleague in uh, in the other school. But um, uh, BCLT, the Centre for Literary Translation, um, works in in a, for me, a very interesting environment, which is a school of literature, drama and creative yeah. writing. In other words, not a modern languages set up. And so what we're interested in from the research point of view is in, well, what is specific to literary translation then? What distinguishes yeah. literary translation? The questions that it uh, poses um, and the kinds of work that we do, what distinguishes that from other kinds of translation? And um, so I'm interested um, in... Uh, how literary translators do or do not use technology, for example. Yeah. This, this has been yeah, a yeah. To topic which yeah. uh, has come up. Uh, in, Everybody in, in says our... you can't use it for literary. I know right. literary translators who, who use translation memories. Why not? Yeah. Yes, yes. But well, yeah. we all do. I mean, I think you know. Of course, literary translators use all kind use technology for all, in all kinds of ways. Um, yeah. But then, you know, how far do we take it? How far could we take it? Mm. Um, how far might research in machine translation impinge on what literary translation does and if it doesn't or doesn't yet what does that mean for what literary translators do do then what is it about literary translation that might resist exposure to uh technology mm -hmm. um yeah. what yeah. and so so that, that do you that's think that's, that's an area for research that we can do some experimenting I, I, or... well it's I mean, it's it's a, a topic that i, I i'm aiming to do more research mm -hmm. in myself um and i think it's also it's also um an area where uh, we can uh, we can communicate what's going on in translation very readily with the general public actually mm. because um uh, i think that you know the the average uh the person on the omnibus um when asked about translation, will naturally think about the button that they press on their mm. on their computer that might translate a web page, for example. And I think you know that's uh, so. If the reality of literary translation is very different from that, uh, is there a convergence course there, or 
or not. Um, I think those are questions which um, would uh, represent a way into the world of literary translation for those who are currently, who, who don't currently mm. have much of an idea uh, about it. We, we are uh, thankfully hearing and seeing evidence of the increasing popularity of, of, of literary uh, translation in the sense that more literary translations are are being bought and, and being read. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that that necessarily uh, translates into a, an awareness of what literary translators do um, and that the kind of work that literary translation is. And I think there's still quite a, a, a deal of work to be done, simply as far as sort of consciousness raising, about what are the kinds of difficulty that, that literary translators uh, have to tackle. And uh, as I say, coming back to simply that point about uh, you know, what, what is the human element in literary translation? Um, so I think yes, I mean, there, 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 there's, there are potentially a lot of a lot of approaches to that question, um, and the, the kind of the, uh, a lot of opportunities for you know, asking the translators out there uh, what their uh, responses would be. I mean, I'm for the moment just thinking uh, you know, about my own responses to that, but there's certainly uh, a stage where um, uh, more groupthink uh, would be more appropriate. Okay. Lycan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.